Ashley. Thank you. I'd like to call this meeting to order, and I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are in Treaty 1 territory on the traditional homeland of the Métis Nation. My name is Carrie Linklater. I'm the chairperson today. To my immediate left is Mr. Maurice Theron, and to my far left, Mr. Richard Whitford. Our city assessor is Mr. Jason Brown. Our admin secretary is Ms. Bellin Rojo. We will be hearing applications for revision of the assessment role in accordance with the Municipal Assessment Act. The matters for which revision is requested have been described in each application, and we will limit discussion to those matters. The statements that applicants or the assessor make at this hearing are sworn testimony, and anyone speaking to the matters must be sworn in. Be advised that comparison of assessments of properties are not considered evidence of market value by the board. The board is appointed annually by city council and is independent of it and the city administration. It makes its decisions on the basis of the evidence provided at this hearing and issues a written order that will be mailed to all parties as soon as possible. Please note that the board's decisions with respect to an application may be appealed to the Manitoba Municipal Board if the matter pertains to assessed value or classification or to the Court of Queen's Bench if the matter pertains to the application of exemptions from taxation. Should you wish to appeal, information on how to do so will be included with your order. With respect to the hearing process, I will confirm the matters to be addressed with each applicant following the swearing in. We will then have the assessor's testimony followed by questions that the other applicant may have, and then the applicant's testimony followed by questions. Each side will have an opportunity to summarize if they wish. Once all the evidence about an application has been brought forward, the applicant may leave. Excuse me. The process will repeat for each item on the docket today. The session will close after all the applications have been heard, and the board will deliberate in private and make its decisions. You will receive the order by registered mail as soon as possible. In this information, all public hearings are live streamed, recorded, and will be part of the public record. Good morning, Mr. Slaughter, and good morning, Mr. Brown. Good morning. Whenever you're ready, if you'd like to start us off on the 1177 fight. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, there is an issue of non compliance on this property. I will start with the roll number quickly 1405249210. Uh, subject property is at 1177 Pike Street. Um, on page two of my evidence, uh, at the top we have a request for income information. We can see that both 16 and 17 were both late by about 11 days. Um, the original mailing was due on May 3rd. The certified mailer was due to uh, June 29th. So these were roughly 11 days late. I will note that 2013, 14, and 15 were all submitted on time. Uh, from there, we can turn right to page 15. This is a copy of the income expense mailer that we did receive late. On the subsequent pages, which are not numbered, is the full income and expense mail that we received. And if you turn right to the last page, we can see that this wasn't filled out until July 4th. So it filled out already late, and it wasn't received till July 11th. So based on that, we are seeking uh, non-compliance for this property. And all three properties are the same owner, calling to the same arguments, all the same date received. So, um, we can go through those. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Slaughter, I'll have you present, and then we'll just ask questions. Okay, certainly. So, I have uh, some additional evidence around the non compliance penalty, but I may submit that at this moment. I've got, uh, I've got six copies here, so maybe one can go. 
Before I commence, Madam Chair, if I may, I just have a couple of very quick questions of Mr. Brown regarding this issue. Or would you like me to reserve the questions for after? Reserve them for after? Yeah, that's fine. Unless they're going to have bearing on what you're going to say. It does, but 6 and 1, it, it can come after. Okay. Okay, so this is an issue that um, we've had raised a number of times um, over this cycle and last cycle. And this document, and I'll try and be uh, brief when going through it, but what it is is our presentation around the concept of substantial compliance. There are many decisions and court decisions from the boards and courts around the non-compliance penalty, and there is a theme that I'll describe in some of the quotes that suggests that the point of the penalty is to motivate the owners to provide the information so that the assessment department can do their job, and that timeliness is something that is considered. The penalty should be enacted when there's a failure to respond. That's the language. That has to be a failure. Once a failure is established, the penalty shall be imposed. But the key point that's discussed in the court case when in management, part of the Richardson case, is that um, there has to be an establishment of failure. Failure can be described, in our opinion, as no response. But uh, there is an expansion of the concept of failure um, to include an insufficient response, for example. But the point is that the penalty should not be a punishment. The penalty should be a mechanism to entice owners to provide the information which the city well needs to do their job. Keep in mind that the mailers that we're discussing, I think the predominant one that Mr. Brown is concerned about is the 2017. And the reasoning is the 2017 mailer describes the last full year before the reference date, April 18, which is germane for the 2020 assessment. But the 2020 assessment isn't prepared, at least the role isn't closed, until approximately May of 2019. We have a lot of time between what the submission date was and the time that they need to finish the role. And this is a concept that's gone over, been uh, discussed many times. So we, we, we Submit that Section 54.3.2, dealing with the penalty, should be applied in very limited circumstances. Basically, when there is no attempt to complete the uh, form or if there's a, a, another sort of failure involved. Is this in your... In your yeah, th this is on page one. This is just the introduction. That's okay. Okay. And now I'll start going into actual quotes. Okay. So on, on page three, you'll see the language of the legislation itself. And it, it, it's basically saying that Section 16.1 allows the city to ask for this kind of information. And when it comes to... Um, uh, income and expense information, if there is a failure, and I'll draw your attention to the end of that page, it says the effect of providing no information, 54.3.2, when a person failed to comply with a request for information or documentation under Clause 16.1c, the board or panel shall specify in its order that any reduction in the assessed value of the person's property is not to take effect. So you can see the point, it's a two-point um, process that the board has to go through. Was there a failure? And the failure in the title of this description is no providing no information. And then if, if there was a failure, then we shall impose the penalty. So that implies a concept of complete failure. And we submit that the boards have typically allowed for uh, a concept of substantial compliance. So long as the job that they're trying to do can be done. A leading municipal board decision, now, Mr. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm, I'm now on page four, and I'll talk about this concept of substantial compliance. On page four, there, there is a decision from the municipal board that we thought was very interesting. It's A98448, and we include that in our, uh, in our evidence. But what the decision contemplates is that there is a time for compliance that may be read into the penalty provision. And the board states in that order, the order says that for the penalty provisions to apply, a demand for information must strictly comply with section 16. Now, if I may pause for a moment, there is something I'm going to discuss <coughs> later, and that is we don't even have the proof of the failure because we have no proof of, of actual submission of the request. There's nothing in the assessor's evidence to suggest that. 
but I'll come back to that point. A demand that does not strictly, strictly comply with Section 16 is invalid, and the penalty does not apply. The owner says the assessor may only make the demand for purposes of making an assessment. The owner says the penalty provision is not tied to the requirement to respond within 21 days as set up in Section 16. This is the board's response. The board finds that because the assessor admitted that the role was closed when the demand for information was made, the demand could not have been made been made for the purpose of making the 1998 assessment. As such, the assessor cannot rely on that demand to support the application of Section 62.2 with respect to the 98 assessment. Uh, then I'll go on to page 6, where the board states, the board also finds that the time for compliance may be read into Section 62.2. The board agrees with the owner that only where the information is not provided in a timely way for use in preparing the general assessment would Section 2.2 have application. So what they're saying is, look, if, if, if you're late, but it's within a reasonable amount of time, then we can still do our job. The penalty shouldn't be applied. The penalty is a very strict penalty. And the legislation, let's go back to the point that it seems to be very clear. It has to be a failure, no response. So they're reading in that there can be a stretch of time, so long as the city can do their job. Uh, I, I'll skip past this section on court decisions in paragraph 7. What this is contemplating is that when we look at the Act, we need to look at the entire scheme and not just pick out one paragraph and say, aha, a penalty should be imposed. And the scheme of the Act in our mind, and this is corroborated by the decision of Richardson, is that, again, the whole point of the penalty is to stop people from not complying. Now, this is coming from a court decision that you've probably heard many times. It's called Richardson et al. It actually involves four cases around the non-compliance penalty. Uh, and the board states, in the middle of page 6, there is a general agreement that requests for information concerning income expense, expenses are sent out so that the information will be available to the assessor as the general assessment role is being prepared. As long as the assessor receives the information before completing the assessment role, the assessor is usually content. The whole purpose of the legislation is to facilitate the gathering of information by the assessor so that the general assessment role can be completed on a timely basis. The concern of the assessor is not to punish the owner who fails to respond to the request for information, but rather not to be blindsided in a subsequent appeal to the Board of Revision or the Municipal Board. That's clearly not the case here. This is July, to, um, sorry, it's July 2018 when the information was received. A number of days after the certified mail that we don't have in evidence as proof that the owner ever received would have been dated. Clearly enough time for the uh, roles and responsibilities of the city to be met. Another municipal board order, A06343, the board commented that the solicitor for the city assessor noted that the Court of Appeal had determined that if the requested information is provided after the 21-day requirement but before the assessment roles are closed, there is substantial compliance. There's a decision from Edmonton that it's called Boardwalk, and it's a very interesting decision because it talks about the idea of penalties like this. And in Edmonton, it's a little different. Yes, sir. Can I just interrupt you? Yes, sir. If you're going to go through the whole document in this fashion, will you please reference us to the page and the paragraph you're sir, referring to? Yes. I would appreciate that. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Certainly. Uh, so if, if you'd like me to back up, I can go back to that quote I just read. Yeah. Yeah. That was on page 8 of my submission. Thank you. That's very uh, Sorry about that. Uh, and... If you wish to see the actual uh, in-context language, I'll direct you to the page in Lichersen. <clears throat> you will find that on page 39. And you'll see it in yellow. Uh, and that's the highlight from the actual Lichersen court case. So that, that's the quote that I'm reading. Uh, now, in this case, uh, Mr. Whitbread, I'm, I'm not going to quote this decision. And the reason that this boardwalk decision I contemplate on, on or I discuss on page 7, I, I don't think it's too germane for today. It's an interesting discussion because it talks about the fact that penalties are for, you know, when you really fail and you have to understand substantial compliance. But it's a different province, so I'm going to uh, step past that. I think there's enough precedence in our province around this issue. So if I may bring you then to page 9, this is, this is kind of our summary in paragraph 18 on page 9. 
that in previous municipal board and court decisions, the assessor's position has been characterized as not to penalize the taxpayer, but rather to obtain the information for use in making the assessment. In the Richardson case that I cited a moment ago, the court stated the concern of the assessor is not to punish the owner who fails to respond to a Section 61 request, but rather not to be blindsided in a subsequent appeal of the Board of Revision or Municipal Board. Now, the last interesting bit of information I'd like to share with you, if I may ask you to turn to page 123, it's near the end of the submission. We, we've now heard the boards and the courts are saying, look, if it's, if it's a little bit late, you can't impose this drastic penalty. That's just, that's not fair. There's been substantial compliance. But now a really good question is, well, what is too late? When is it too late? Because we agree there's a point when the, the city can't do their job and, and the city has to be able to do their job. On page 123 is a request from one of our clients to the city of Winnipeg stating that, as with many of our clients, the timeline to submit these forms is very tight uh, and can they have an extension to July 31st? And it was granted. And this is just one of many examples. Uh, the point being that clearly July 31st is still sufficient for the city to be able to do their job. So, in summation, Madam Chair, uh, you will hear from my question the response, I believe, anyway, I don't want to put words in Mr. Brown's mouth, but I don't think the city has any evidence of an actual request formally being made, which is one of the fundamental pillars upon which the request for the penalty should be based. There has to be proof the owner received the questionnaire. But beyond that, and much more importantly, is that the courts and the boards allow for the concept of substantial compliance, which say as long as the city can do their job, and somebody's a bit late for many very good reasons, this harsh penalty should not be imposed. So I ask the board not to impose the penalty in, in each of these three cases which are identical circumstances. Thank you. Um, questions? Um, so you're not disputing that it was late? Uh, yes, I am, because I, I don't have anything in evidence to show me what the date was for the, that the owner would have received. Well, on the last page of my evidence, it shows that it wasn't even filled out until July 4th. Mm -hmm. But do we have anything in evidence to state what the date was that they had to comply by? For me? Uh, on page, the previous page, at the top right hand corner, the due date was May 3rd for that mailing. Yeah, and there is a second certified mailer that goes out that is usually presented as part of the evidence. That's right? true. Um, we do send out certified mailers. Um, I didn't feel that it was necessary because they did comply. However, it was late. Um, the Litterson case does state that it's um, the assessor has discretion on whether to send a second request for information or a reminder if there's no response to the first. However, there's nothing in the MAA that requires it to do so. One request brought to the attention of the property owner is, or its agent is sufficient. Um, and that's within the Lit uh, Richardson case. And then it says the deferral penalty cannot be applied if the assessor fails to prove that the request for information was brought to the owner's attention. Uh, a request for information sent to the agent is effective against the owner only if the owner is held out of the assessor that the agent had authority to receive the request. So that just has to do with the um, who to send it to. So, Mr. Brown, I guess that, that's the main concern that we have. Well, not, sorry, not the main concern. The main concern is that this is substantially compliant. A secondary concern is that, as you just read, there has to be proof that the owner received this mailer. And we don't know if this was received by a tenant who eventually passed it on to the owner or if the owner went to the city after the fact and, and made a request because they never received it. And that's a fundamental part of this penalty is to prove that they actually received it. True. Um, it was sent to the same... Um address as 2013, 14, and 15, which were all received on time. However, 16 and 17 were both late. Okay, I understand. My concern is that we don't have that in evidence, which typically is a key part of the city's uh, position. Uh, now, to be fair, to answer your question, is it late from the date that you stated of June 29th? I would agree it's 11, well, 13 days late. 
but I would uh, submit that there is ample evidence that the boards are empathetic uh, in a case like this that they would consider substantially compliant with the request. Okay, thank you. Those are all my questions. Stuart Brent. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> did you just say it was 13 days late? Uh, I did a very quick math there. So July 11th from a June 29th apparent uh, deadline. Twelve, I guess. I'm counting the okay. business days you, you use, not to quibble. Yeah. Um, do you think the onus will be on the president to understand the ramifications of not submitting on time? He or she signed the documents late and submitted them late. One would think that's a fairly responsible position in the company. They realize they're working with a organization that has deadlines. Not evident to you that the onus is on the president to make it on time. Well, I, I think that the main point is when imposing this penalty, which appears to be by the legislation uh, reserved for a complete failure of submission, that that then opens up the question of what is wh where is the lines drawn then between a complete failure and something that's 11, 12 days late. Yeah, I get that. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, to answer the question, I'm, I'm sure that. Uh, the owner would have preferred to have this on time. Uh, the city would prefer it to be on time. Things happened in this case, and we're looking to the boards and the court's direction on what to do when we're in the gray area between the complete failure contemplated in the legislation mm -hmm. and something that just doesn't make us very happy. I think I'm trying to go to intent. Yeah. And if the intent is to float the law or the regulation and move myself into the gray area, yeah. Hmm. You understand the ramifications. I, I do. Yeah, I understand where you're going to, and I, I, I would suggest that nothing here makes me think there was an intent to float the city or float the system. They have complied. They gave all the information that they think they needed to do. Uh, I've actually tried to get a hold of the owner to find out why they were late. Had they made a request? Did they receive the mailer? I didn't receive any response. But that, uh, uh, you know, I've seen this happen many times. It's an elderly owner. Uh, he just started getting new staff involved. Things slip between the cracks. Um, I don't think the legislation contemplates a penalty being imposed in a case like this. It's really a minor infraction in my mind. Madam Chair, can I direct a question? Yes, I was going to say, we'll just ask questions open. from both parties. You, yeah. Chair. Can you repeat <clears throat> why there's no mailer? Because it's the first time I've not seen one on an on-call. Um, <clears throat> why there was no certified mailer? Uh, no, no. Why, well, why you haven't included a certified mailer? Well, I felt that because they did comply, I mean, we can prove that they got it because they complied. Mm -hmm. um, this was the original mailing, which was due May 3rd. Um, and the city's not obligated to send a, a secondary mailer. Um, we did send one, and I probably should have included it. Um, so by default, using your own words, they did comply. They did comply, however, they... There, there is a non-compliance here. They did comply, they complied late. Well, um, 60, and I mean, we can turn to Mr. Slaughter's page 3, 16.2 uh, states that uh, where a person, including Crown Agency or Crown Corporation, receives a written request from an accessor under subsection 1, the person shall, within 21 days of receiving the request, provide information or documentation to the extent of the... So it says there is um, in the legislation the 21 days which was failed. The due was failed. And, and the language is clear. It says shall not may. Yes. Right. Okay. No further questions. Thank you. I'm trying to think here. Uh, <coughs> so I'm trying to get those timelines as well. And by the way, I, if I uh, when you refer to sacraments like on page one, could you attach them because uh, 53, 3B, and so on? I don't think they were attached to your brief. Um, in other words, uh, Sorry, why don't we refer to on page one? The relevant legislation. Should yeah, be. but you see, I don't think it's there. On page Unless 10. I missed it. On page 10. It's on page 10? Yeah. Okay. Okay, and and my uh, my colleague was asking about 
So a letter was sent out as a follow-up in this case? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, it would have been nice to have it in the file. I agree. The, the appellant also refers to June 30th. Your notice talks about May the 3rd. So I'm not sure where the 13 days come from because they were due on May the 3rd. But does the second letter give another date? It does, June 29th. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. So that's why if we had it, we could tie this all together. Of course. Um, and there was no request made for an extension. That is correct. Okay. Well, we, do we know that? Do we have anything in evidence of that? Um, it would be in our files if there was. And I looked and there wasn't. They had, no, I thought I saw one in the past, but uh, I might be mistaken. But you're, as, as far as you're concerned, I mean, you, we're both, you're both under, under, under oath, so I'm trying to I respect res that as well. I looked in our system and I didn't see anything for a uh, Now, uh, I don't know what this means, uh, Mr. Slaughter. I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. uh, on page five. Of my submission? Yeah, of your, this one. Yeah. Of your, yes. yeah. Uh, you say 60 at the top, second paragraph. Mm -hmm. You refer to what also finds the times of clients may be read into section 62.2. Um, so what is that? Uh, because we always refer to to, uh, to the, the 50s. part here. Yeah. Uh, so what, what's is that a different period or it's, is that a different section? It's the exact same uh, language of legislation. It pertains to the municipal board, though. So it's it's the same language. And okay. one, the one that I'm submitting here because we're at the Board of Revision, yeah. is the language surrounding uh, 54.3.2 is surrounding the penalty of the Board of Revision. Okay. And then further in the Act is the same language, but if you're in front of the Municipal Board. Okay. So because the quotes that I'm reading are from the Municipal Board, they're talking about the same language, but they're calling it 62 points. Okay, well that's why I was wondering yeah. where yeah. that was coming from. Yeah. Uh, okay, and I understand your argument that the substantial compliance is the, the yeah. failure, you, you have two points here from what I understand. They did not, there was no failure to respond right. in the full sense of the word. And there's substantial compliance. Those are your two main points? Two main points. And a third point is that uh, it is fundamental in the language of the courts that when this penalty is imposed, there has to be proof of receipt. And I understand Mr. Brown's position. Well, they, they, they comply, so, but that doesn't answer the main question that has to be answered. Who signed for this form and what do you have as proof of receipt? It's not in evidence. That's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Brown, yes. just one question in regards to the lateness of this information. When does the city actually start looking at the data it receives? Um, we start with, I mean, with the two-year cycle. Obviously, things are accelerated. Um, we start looking at them right away. Obviously, it takes some time to get through them all. So, then I'm going to say July 1st because we've got a request of June 29th, sometimes June 30th. Well, they start coming in in April and May when we first send them out. Um, we do start going through them and we are already preparing a roll for 2022. So. so when you're getting them in May and June or April, how many are you getting? Um, I don't know the actual uh, level of compliance. I normally do hotels. I know we get about 60% of them back. But I'm going to say you don't get 100. You don't get 200. You get in the thousands. Correct. Correct. Okay. Madam Chair, may I ask a question yes, following you may. a bit? <clears throat> so when you open a file in a new year, does somebody enter a date? I do this because I'm thinking on a computer, but maybe on a piece of paper. Uh, we're opening a file on this property and we're starting to do the assessment on September 1st. You do have that date of when that file was open? No. So as we get them, we have a system where we input the data into our system, yeah. which will then go to the modelers. Um, it puts it in a format where then they can um, use the data to create the models. But it should register a date as to when that happened. When it was entered into our system? Yeah. That's correct. 
So that, just for our sake, say, if you didn't start this file until September 11, that date, September 15, <laughs> um, then your process is really not hindered by the data coming into you, in spite of all the regulations, in spite of you, the process is not hindered by that data coming to you in July. That would be correct. However, if every property owner submitted on July 11th, it, <laughs> no, no. it would create that. problems. We're only talking about this one. Of course, but okay. Okay, in terms of being fair to all the other property owners. No, that, I understand now. So you could, sorry, you could have that in evidence then. Look, we started this file on September 11th. We received the material, and I don't know why you would do that. It would be up to the Apollo and Ross to ask for that. You could provide that date. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm done. Okay, thank you. Uh, we will make a decision. No, we'll leave. Oh. <laughs> we'll leave. This uh, meeting back to order, and uh, Mr. Brown, we are going to deny the non -coma. Thank you. So, if you would like to proceed with um, 11775. Okay, we actually have a recommendation today for this property. Uh, so, the original value was $1,155,000. Uh, I'm going to recommend a revised NOI of uh, we have two income streams on this. There's a restaurant and a flex warehouse. Um, do you want the NOI separated or combined? Or separated. Okay, please. so uh, NOI for the flex warehouse at 22766 And the NOI for the restaurant at $36,026. So combined... Fifty-eight thousand seven hundred and ninety-two, and that's capped at a seven point five percent capitalization rate. Which is that for both of them? Yeah, for both. Thank you. Which generates a revised assessment of seven hundred eighty-four thousand dollars. And what is the reason for the reduction? Um. These buildings are quite tired. Um, they're suffering from some deferred maintenance. Um, you can see the pictures in Mr. Slaughter's brief. I believe the restaurant needs some work to bring it up to code, etc. Uh, sorry, and would you say the condition then of the building is below average? Yes. Did you inspect the property? I have not. Um, I mean, you could tell just from the outside, and then once I saw Mr. Slaughter's interior pictures, it became quite evident. Okay. Thank you. Um, panel, did you have any questions of Mr. Lamb? No. Just bear with me for a while. In the meantime, just repeat those NOIs. Yes. Individually for me. Uh, so for the Flex Warehouse, 22766 Okay. And for the restaurant, $36,026. $26,000. Okay. Mm -hmm. May I go ahead now? Yes. So I'm assuming, given we have no permits attached, that you don't have permits on file. It doesn't look like any work's been done on these properties quite some time. Okay. Thank you. No further questions. Um, I think Mr. Barnes is, is uh, and I, I thank you for taking the time to look through the evidence. Uh, yeah, as he mentions, there's pictures in the in our evidence at the end to give you a sense of what these properties are like as far as condition. Um, and what I'd like to do, Madam Chair, is accept Mr. Brown's offer, but I haven't been able to, as I mentioned earlier, talk to the owner since the, the last two days. So it's with the caveat that should the owner not be satisfied, they have the opportunity to go to the municipal board, which I guess they would because this will be a decision of the board. It's not a 15-1 agreement. Right. Yeah. So I, I would like to accept that. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Brown, what was your new number, your final number? Uh, $784,000. Nice. Right. I cannot get that to work. 
Uh, as you've done the math, I'm, I'm fine. 780. You've done the math? Yeah. <laughs> fine. So, uh, I have to make sure now. <laughs> so, well, 58,792 mm -hmm. divided by 0 0.075 is 783,893. Yeah. Divided by 0.075 or 7s? 0.075. Yeah. Oh, oh, I yeah, had yeah, said, yeah, no, no, yeah. I, I did just say 50 percent. There we go. Sorry. My, uh, I might have mumbled. My old hearing. Thank you very much. That yeah. works. So we're just going to look at the pictures that Mr. Slaughter gave us, I guess. We're just interested in seeing, because you used the argument that... Uh, Condition? Yeah. So we can turn to page... I'm just, just curious here. Um, 16 and 17 of Mr. Slaughter's brief. Yeah. Kind of shows the condition of the interior. Okay. Roof, ceiling, then. And even the preceding page shows the condition of the exterior. Okay. okay. Uh, it's not that I'm doubting you, but it's nice for us to have a better understanding of what it looks like. Okay. I haven't been in that restaurant for about 20 years, but it used to be a great Thai restaurant. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic place. Yeah. Okay, we'll move on to the next property. Um, 1175. And there is a non co op on this. And is this the same arguments, Jenny? Exactly the same problem. Exactly the same. Okay. How quickly did this through? I'm sorry? Should I quickly take you through it? Uh, no, you're still okay. good if it's the same argument. Perfect. Um, panel? Same evidence? Same, yes. Same well, evidence? We are going to deny it to the city. Yeah. Okay. So if you would just like to go ahead and present the brief. Yes, I can have Uh So roll number 14052097000. Property is located at 11175 Street. Uh, current 2020 assessment at one million ninety-three thousand, and I'd like to make a recommendation uh, using a revised NOI of fifty-four thousand three hundred fifty-eight. Uh, fifty-four thousand three hundred fifty-eight. Capitalized at seven percent. For a revised value of 777000 And that is based on? Uh, same, same as the previous, yeah in slightly better condition, which is why the 0.5 on the cap difference, but I believe the rents were too high in the model for this property. I agree with you. Uh, panel, any questions? Mr. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I heard what he said, but I haven't written it down. It's terrible. Do you have it? Mr. Did you I'm sorry, I just didn't hear your last comment about why not 75 instead of 7. This building's in slightly better condition. Uh, it's got slightly better rental uh, history. The preceding property had the issue with the restaurant being basically out of commission, uh, except for a few special events. Whereas this one is actually operating uh, pretty much at full capacity, just I believe the rents were a bit too high. Did you visit this property? I have not. Um, so you're going on. I have driven by it a number of times, and I'm familiar with the area. Mm -hmm. And it is the same owner. I believe it has some of the same issues, but not all. Okay. Could you repeat those numbers for me, please? I'm sure. So NOI at 54,358. Capitalized at 7%. For a revised value of seven hundred and seventy-seven thousand. So when we 
look at the financial provided by the owner, I see a non vacancy rate, which your model would probably provide at about 2%. Um, this area might have been 3.5 mm -hmm. or 4. 3.5. So, um, I mean, that's fair and equitable. All, all owners get it. Um, I understand. Okay. No further questions? Okay. Thank you. Mr. Slaughter. Are you accepting this recommendation? Yeah, and, and just to be clear as well, when we accept a recommendation, it's not necessarily on any of the rates or allowances to get to the value. It's just simply on the final number. Uh, and again, with the understanding the owner may not be satisfied. Okay. And I thank you. No, no, I'm fine. It's me. It's me that's slow. It's not me. Okay. 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 And again, is the non-co-op? Same arguments. Same owners, same arguments, same. Okay. And again, we're going to deny to the city. So if you'd like to proceed. I can, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. So roll number 1406287110. Property is located at 1833 Inkster Boulevard. Uh, this is one building uh, consisting of seven premises, all one story. Built in 1972, with a land area of 60,442 and a leasable area of 22,080. Um, I'm going to just say right off the bat that um, I actually agree with Mr. Slaughter's income workup. So this is going to boil down to um, and we'll get to that when Mr. Slaughter presents. It's going to get down to um, Mr. Slaughter's made a, a bottom line deduction for some um, roof repairs that need to be done. But I will go through my evidence quickly. Sure. Yep. Thank you. So uh, rent comparables on page three, um, all located within the area. Uh, in fact, the top one and the bottom one are both on Pipe Street as well. Uh, all these leases are from 2016-2017. Um, we have a range of lease areas from 1,500 square feet up to 6,048 square feet. Uh, wall heights ranging from 16, to, or sorry, 14 to 21 feet. Um, effective years built ranging from 68 up to 77, and we can see the net rents ranging from $6.25 to $6.50. On the following page, which is page four, we have our income workup for the subject property. Here we can see the seven premises. Average rent is $5.43. This generates a gross potential of $119.960. 3.5% uh, vacancy, 2% expenses, shortfall at $3.75, and capitalized at $7 percent, which yields the assessment at 1579 Some pictures on page 10. So this is located on the corner of Inkster and Kuwaitin. On page 10, we can see an aerial photograph of the property. Um, we can see the roof. Um, looks to be um, aging. Um, no argument here that it probably does require some work. Um, however, that's going to be the issue at hand today. Uh, I have some exterior photographs on page 11 and an interior photograph of the restaurant on page 12. Uh, 
floor plan on page 13. These are long skinny uh, units fronting onto Inkster. There is a leasing um, ad on page 14. This is from 1997, so a little bit dated, but uh, it just speaks to the uh, location of the property, um, the size, and some of the amenities uh, for stating a uh, boardroom, fantastic boardroom, um, access to parking, etc. We have the income and expense statements on page 15 and 16. <coughs> and based on that, we ask that the assessment be confirmed at $1,579,000. Thank you. Uh, questions, Mr. Slaughter? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Brown, in your evidence, um, so you're stating that the NOI that uh, is being assessed or capitalized is 110548 correct? Correct. And on page 15 of your submission is the, uh, the mailer that we discussed earlier that was submitted to the city. Correct. Would this have been taken into consideration at, at all for the assessment derivation of the property? Uh, this property uses gross rents, so it's always a little more difficult to um, break it down and decipher what, what's actually happening on the statements. Mm -hmm. um, I will note that your NOI is actually higher than ours, so... Um, that of apply. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That of apply. Yes. yes. Uh, but you agree that the NOI stated, the actual NOI that the property attains on page 15 of your evidence is 33,762, which is just about one quarter, 25% of what's being assessed. Once again, I haven't vetted the expenses. The property management looks a bit high to me. Um, there is another, um, in the other category, there is uh, $10,600, which they don't even state what it's for. Um, so once again, uh, it's good to look at these, but without proper vetting of the numbers, um, not always completely reliable. Um, if you were looking at purchasing a house and the three comparisons of that type of house that you would examine and have an indicated value of $300,000, but the house that you're interested in has a contractor quote for imminent work that required is required of, let's say, $100,000, let's say, for a foundation issue, would that affect your purchase price? Um, depends when buying a house. Um Sometimes you don't know what you're getting, sometimes you do. Uh, sometimes you need to renovate the kitchen. There's a lot of variables in that. But in this case, you, you know that there's a contract report that uh, has been done. The, the vendor has been fair enough to say to you, we need $100,000 work done almost immediately. Here's the quote on it. Would that factor into your potential purchase price? It would, but on the flip side, if the work had been done, would it be worth $100,000 more? I, I'd agree, but at, at the moment that it needs to be done, you'd agree that it would factor into your purchase. I don't think it would be like the exact amount of the quote less, but there, it would have an effect on the value. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. That's all the questions. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. Trying to reconcile. I'll have to wait. Thank you. Ask the. Uh, uh, sorry. No questions. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> You uh, mentioned on the uh, on the page eleven that the roof needs work. Well, I can't see a roof on this one, so I don't. I think you said that the roof needs work. Am I looking at the wrong page? Page, page 10. ten. Yeah. So it almost looks like Lego. <laughs> um, it looks like it's been repaired in, in pieces already. Oh, that's what you mean. Um, okay. I don't, I don't know the extent of it, um, Mr. Slaughter might know more, but it does look like that uh, it has had some work on it already and perhaps it's near the end of its life. <coughs> but I also, I cheated a bit, uh, you said you agreed with the rents uh, that Mr. That the appellant provided, but the, the cap rate is also a difference. Well, I, I agree with the final value. Um, it's only at, what, about $100,000 less, I believe. Okay. Um, how we get to those 
is not, like obviously we don't agree with the 5% or the 7% expenses. Um, but but would, in the end, I, I feel that uh, Mr. Slaughter's value is reasonable. Wow. Um, without the deduction that we're which Well, you're at 1485 and then 400000 We'll see what he has to say about that. Okay, I got my moorings better now. Thank you. Thank you. Did you nope, I, I, I did do that. Okay, that's my question. Thank you. Uh, so, Mr. Brown, so you are acknowledging then from page 10 in your brief that the brief is compromised? I had some suspicions when looking at it in the beginning. Um, Mr. Slaughter's confirmed notes with his, I don't know if there's an actual estimate in here, but he's on the road. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. okay. But, um, um, but was that taken into consideration, or is page um, or is page four of your brief, which is model driven? It is model driven. So you didn't make any adjustments in regards to the roof? Uh, I don't know offhand. Uh, it might have been reviewed and lowered um, due to the condition. Uh, this has been appealed before, so we would have known some of the conditions. Okay. Did you inspect the property? I have not. Do you know what the last time it was inspected? I know the restaurant moved out um, just a few months ago when someone was down there for that. Okay. Um, sorry, I didn't notice what you do. Which, uh, on page four of your brief, under leasable area, which portion was the restaurant? So the restaurant was occupying... Units of F-16. 1,240 square feet. So it would be uh, premise ID 15077. And you've given uh, this a three and a half percent vacancy loss? Yes, that's model for them. So, yes. And so, are you aware if this property has experienced vacancy? I know the restaurant moved out post reference. Right. Um, but that's all I know of. I mean, I believe the mailer shows that it's uh, fully occupied. I just double check that statement. They're showing it a 5% vacant, which um, could just be a couple months. Okay. Um, what was the percentage increase from the last cycle on warehouses? On warehouses, that's a good question. Um, I don't know offhand. I know that this one, no, I don't know what this one was last cycle. I don't think it was a large increase, but I don't know offhand. Okay. I think it was, was it Mr. Slaughter, can you answer it? Maybe. Well, not 100%, uh, but I have the taxes from last cycle, so I worked it backwards, and I think the assessment would have been about $1,140,000. Jason, does that sound? I don't know if you have anything. That's possible. So that would be about 39% increase. Okay, I have no further questions. Mr. Slaughter, do you like to give us your presentation? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, page two shows photograph of property. This is an odd one. Actually, it was an interesting meeting with the gentleman that owns the three properties. He uh, he was the first person to develop properties in Easter Park, the two on Fife, the oldest buildings in Easter Park. And he did this third one in the early 1970s. And uh, they really are different for the area. Um, they are in very, very poor condition. Uh, this property in particular has been going through kind of band-aid solutions for the last number of years, but it is in desperate need of, uh, of renovation. So, uh, Mr. Brown has gone through the description of it, but it's, it's multiple units in the property. Uh, the only one that really um, has had much work done to it is the small unit that was being occupied as a restaurant. And the rent that was obtained for that space reflects the work that was put into it and, and the condition of the space. The rest of this building is very poor warehouse slash storage at this point. 
um, if there are offices, they don't have air conditioning and they're just kind of used to put a desk in this sort of thing. Uh, land to building ratio is rather limited at 2.57 to 1. Uh, parking in the front and the rear is rather limited. So, Madam Chair, what, what is interesting about this valuation is there's two ways to look at it. One is from a lease fee perspective. What is the property actually performing at? And as part of that analysis, is there anything that leads us to believe that these are not at market transactions? And they are, in fact, all market transactions. These are arm's length tenants that occupy the property. They're paying very low rents, and I'll get into that in a moment, and they're paying them on a gross basis. The result is that on a leased fee basis, the owner is only attaining, and is pretty consistent, around $33,000 per annum. But what we've done, I think in both cases, the city and ourselves, is look at this from a fee simple. So in other words, well, in a best case scenario with a little TLC, um, could this property perform like it's uh, the surrounding properties? But the key is that you need to spend money to get money. Um, in this condition, I would suggest that they can't even get new tenants in the building because it wouldn't meet occupancy co uh, code. I think these tenants are probably grandfathered. But if they, they ever tried to get someone new, I think they'd have to put a lot of work into that unit. The condition is so poor. The roof is about to cave in. They're doing, for the last 10 years, I believe it has been, uh, nearly $10,000 a year in Band-Aid repairs. But that's that can't last. So I guess the point is that when we either the city or what we did in our initial income approach. If we look at that sort of best case scenario, Rosie's, um, we could attain four times the income sort of scenario, we have to understand that it'll cost money to get there. And that's the way the market behaves. Nobody would buy this property and have a pro forma estimating over $100,000 income without knowing that there's going to be considerable costs, uh, imminent costs, to get there. Now, uh, before this board, we've talked at length about some of the allowances that are given in an income approach for both structural reserve and the non-recovered expenses to bring space up to the condition that tenants will pay um, the sort of rents that the city's applying. These are real expenses, and they, they need to be accounted for. We've gone through this many times uh, over the typical life of the property. But above and beyond that, the market will recognize that if something's imminent, we need to address that before we can even imagine starting to get higher rents or higher income. On page 7, Madam Chair, I'd like to go through what's actually happening today at the property. This is pulled from the actual income and expense mailers, so this is uh, the actual story of the property. The city is applying a, a net rent of approximately 639 square foot. In actuality, the property, you'll see in the second last column on page 7, the face rents are, are barely that on a gross basis. The only one that's different is the one unit that has, has had the uh, considerable work put in for the restaurant that's now vacant, and that's F-16. They actually pay a fairly healthy rent. Everything else is ranging from 333 to 794, or 832, sorry, gross. If I can now direct your attention, please, I'll skip ahead a little bit, but to page um, 27. You'll see the financial picture from both revenue and expense uh, perspective for the year 2017. You'll see in the revenue that the income is 133925 That's the total sum of the gross rents that I described. And you'll see that there are no recoveries. And you'll see that the expenses in the second column uh, total 100162 This is not including any capital expenditures, which wouldn't be included in, a, uh, uh, in the income itself. It does have repairs and maintenance, though. The expenses total $4.19 a square foot. So if we're looking at an average gross rent, notwithstanding the restaurant, of I think it was approximately $5 or $6 a square foot, we have to deduct these expenses to get down to the actual net. The actual net is about 2 to $3 a square foot. That's what they're actually getting from arm's length tenants, and it's because of the condition of the property. So if we were to say that, hey, it would be great to get 5 or $6 net out of this property, well, yeah, that, that would be fantastic. We see it in the market. We go through that in our presentation. But those properties aren't in this condition. If they could, they would, I guess is the, the mantra I like to say. Um, 
but that would cost a considerable amount of money right off the top. So what we have here is an income approach both from Altus and the city, which is similar. We are actually going a bit higher, four times the amount of the actual NOI, but it was based on the very important uh, primary step of addressing the condition of the property. I'd like to now turn your attention, please, to page 31. And this is the most recent roofing quote. If they are to stop trying to band-aid the situation, which isn't going to last much longer, if they ever have a hope of attaining any new tenancy and passing City of Winnipeg uh, occupancy codes, this has to be addressed. And the quote is for $421,000 before GST. And it, it describes what needs to be done. Remove and discard the existing BUR roofing membrane from the existing roof. Replace any wet insulation and rotten roof deck supply and install new plumbing stacks and exhaust vents. You saw the, the condition of some of these spaces from my pictures on Fife, and it's similar in Inkster. The roof is, is caving in. It just can't last. Uh, and it goes on. Install fully adhered SBS roof system. So it basically needs a complete replacement. The second uh, page of that quote shows the, the roof, and you can see, and you can see it in Mr. Brown's evidence, it, it's, uh, what was the description you had, like a Lego, and that's what it looks like. You can see that it's just been constant repairs. It's, it's well past its age life. There was a, a quote done previously by another company which didn't have as much of a extensive repair that was less at $215,000. And they show pictures here on page 33 and on of the roof. It's just... It needs to be addressed. And, and I come back to the point I made to, to Mr. Brown. I understand the city's position that, well, we'd like to amortize these sort of costs over the life of the building. Um, I'm not sure how that works, if that's amortized into the income, and then we capitalize that. But the fact is, people won't ignore this in the market. And our, our goal here today, by the legislation, is to determine the market value. And I'm suggesting strongly that if anybody wants to look at this property other than what it is, they have to do this work. So I basically present two options to the board. One is we take what's actually happening, $33,000, and we capitalize that at a, uh, a cap rate being discussed by the city and ourselves, 7.5%. Uh, and our value would be very low. It would be about $450,000. And I would suggest that's probably not what the market would do. The market would say, we can do better than that. But before we do better, we have to address the concerns. The concerns are about $400,000. How good can we do? I'd like to now address or sorry, turn your attention to page um, 10. And what we've done, uh, sorry, Madam Chair, I'll back up. If I could go to page 8, I'll go through this step by step. We've gone through the thought process of a potential purchaser saying we can do better than 33000 in income. Let's look what's happening in the market. That's at the top of page 8. And this is basically on par with what the city's evidence is. We're basically corroborating the city's assumptions on potential market rent. And uh, we come out to about $5 net, and we allow the higher amount on that restaurant space, the net rent of 15 The blended rent is $5.52. We're a little higher than what the city said. So we're saying if, if this property underwent proper renovations, repairs, and restorations, this is what we could do. We then would do what a typical purchaser would do and make the allowances for vacancy over the holding period, the loss of recovered expenses over the holding period, because again, this scenario is now envisioning net rents that would be better for the owner, um, erosion for non-recovered expenses, and we're asking, again, that more than 2% be allowed because we haven't yet considered leasing costs, tenant commissions, and all those sort of things that typically are allowed. And then we capitalize that at, um, we have 7.75%. That would give us a value not far off from the city's value on page 10, 1.485 uh, million. But of course, again, it's predicated on requiring work to be done. At minimum, I'm applying 400,000 for that imminent roof repair, and that would bring us to 1,085,000. So in summary, we either imagine doing the work and then getting what the property could attain with the proper work done. That brings us to a million eighty-five thousand, or we capitalize the income in place. And that brings us to about four hundred and twenty thousand. To assess the property any higher than that without consideration for the work required um, 
is to overassess this property. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, Mr. Just a couple of things. Um, quickly, just turning to your income and expense statements, I believe it's at page 20, 1 to 23 is the 2016 statement um, showing a net operating income of 32762 that's in 47 cents. Um, just a couple pages further, with us page 27, we have the 2017 mailer showing the exact same NOI. And if you actually go through the expenses, it's identical. Um, probably not common to have a property generating the exact same income and expenses over two years. Do you agree? I agree. Okay, so those look a little suspect uh, on the surface, and I don't feel that um, we can place a lot of weight on those. It looks like you just photocopied them, really. Yeah, I, well, to be fair, Mr. Brown, though, I think it is giving a picture of what a typical year is in this property. I mean, he's telling us the basic facts. The rents are definitely gross, and he corroborates that on the statement of the rent verification. And the expenses of 419, that doesn't seem out of line from, from our experience. I understand. Yeah. But those, those two are identical, so um, yeah. something happened there. Um, having said that, I do think that you probably captured... Um, the actual rents better are, like you were saying, um, and the higher capitalization rate, which would carry, shows the higher risk of the property with the deferred maintenance. Um, roof estimate at 400,000, um, we feel that that should be amortized over the life of the roof replacement, which would be 25 years, which would equal about $16,000. Uh, we feel improvement, I guess I'm making a statement, to pose that as a question. Um, would you feel that a prudent investor would not um, amortize that over, over the lifespan of the repairs and, and apply that going forward? No, I, I don't quite understand that logic. I mean, if I'm buying a house that I know it requires $100,000 immediately, like if the roof is caving in, it's a great house, I love it otherwise. But I'm not going to say, well, I'll give you $10,000 less because you know, over the life of the, uh, of the house. I mean, I'm going to pay um, what I think the property is worth, and that's the value minus the required repairs. So, you know, I, I, I'm trying to understand that logic from the city's point. And, and I guess here is, here's something that the owners have to watch out for, is that when the work is done, a supplementary assessment should be issued, right? If this is the value and the work is done. And so maybe what the city's trying to say is, instead of having subs issued all the time, uh, this this is what we typically allow. I think that's probably the, the gist of it. It, it. it could be, but it, I don't think it addresses the reality of the situation. I don't think, based on the evidence that we see before us from both sides, um, this property can't attain that kind of income without the required work. So somebody's going to factor that in when they purchase the property. Okay, those are all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lickard. I have the same question on the income statements, uh, income and revenue statements. But Ask and answer. <clears throat> yeah, uh, got a couple of questions here. Obviously, you've got a couple of quotes, and the uh, first one is 421. GS student will talk on page 31. Then we look at the page 33, where there's a roof replaced, but A1R16, I don't know exactly what that means, but they're at 88,000. And then um, you've got 215 on the roof B1R16, so I, I'm assuming both are, are possible. Uh, why did you decide to use 400,000? Uh, when you've got these two different quotes here. Because they seem, they're both, as far as I know, reputable. I don't know if MG Roof is still in business, because one of them was having problems lately. Yeah. But uh, why did you pick uh, that one? That's a good question. I went through these two quotes. I was trying to figure out what is being contoured. Obviously, there's a different scope here. Uh, one is saying, you know, you can get away with this, and the other one saying, no, to do it properly is this. 
Uh, and I couldn't really tell the difference. In fact, your point now, I'm wondering if, are they saying roof A1 and B1 are separate sections and they might be totaling that? I'm well, not too sure. Uh, well, it says recommendation number one, roof replacement, roof A1 or 16, and then he details that and looks to be basically close. I did analyze it. Then he goes to roof B1 or 16. Haven't got a clue what that means. No, I, I actually, now that I see this, Mr. Therian, I think he is saying there's two separate roofs on here. Roof one is a metal decking, and then there's a second section. Roof B1 is an asphalt and gravel. So I think what he's actually saying is there's two parts to do. And that, that actually makes sense to me more now. Yeah. Uh, any damage to you that will be a different cost? Okay, mechanical and crane. But he's got any damage steel deck as well on the note. So I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's it. It's unclear to me anyway. It is. So in the end, I was left with okay. I've got two different quotes, and and now that I look at this, I think what this is saying is about three hundred thousand versus four hundred thousand. So I went with the most recent quote. It seemed to make more sense. Why? Why did you not? Uh, and I was curious because I looked back. Uh, why did you use a cap rate issue here to deal with that? A great and question. Yeah, I, yeah, I because that's what I've been looking at here. Well, I have, Why I have to use a cash rate issue here. It's a great question, Mr. Green. I have a third jotted down alternative. Is that okay? Let's then use the hypothetical income, but let's capitalize that as something that reflects all this work. You know, it would be a very high capitalization rate. But then the question of the board would be, where did you get that from? Yeah. How do you well, know? <laughs> so I'm really coming back to the same thing each time. You see, I went to the cities. If you allow me, Ms. Madam Chair, Go right ahead. I went to the city's chart, and I went, and I'm not sure it's industrial me, but anyway, it's a multi-tenant, and the range could be between five and a half and nine eighty. Yeah. So I looked at that, and I said, well, can that be an option based on the condition? That's. I think this is great because right here, my note is an income with a nine seven five cap rate. <laughs> but I thought, okay, I'm not going to describe that because they're going to ask. Well, you're you're you close to the maximum of the city at 980. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that's a very good point, Mr. Turner. It's another way. I actually it. worked that out at that rate. Too. Okay. <laughs> but that doesn't mean where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> Just to note that would be reserved for the worst buildings in Winnipeg. What's that? That would be reserved for the worst buildings in Winnipeg. Is it right? Okay. Well, that's the absolute fine. worst. So. But I was trying to get some evidence I to back. How we approach this thing, so I don't know. And that's a great. But to get to Mr. Slaughter's number, you'd have to use 11 percent. Yes. Yeah. Maybe. Which? Yeah. 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 That's yeah. even yeah. worse. Yeah. 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 Okay. And that's really all I had. Uh, is obviously the roof is not in good condition, and there is the issue of trying to put an amount every year to try and cover things that come up, but it seems to be. Confusing in this case, anyway, that not much was put aside for mm -hmm. future work. Uh, that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Okay. Madam Chair, I'm <laughs> sorry. No Once in a while, I get mixed up. Thank you. Um, Mr. Slaughter, so you inspected this property? I had a chance to only inspect the exterior with the owner because the tent, when I got there, it was after five. And so we had to go around the outside. He described what was going on inside. I could look through the windows. Uh, that was the, this was the one building I couldn't get in. Okay. Did you have a visual on the roof then? No, just from these quotes. They okay. described it. I said, I need something, please, in writing. Okay. And then they sent me the quotes. Okay. Okay. So, um, would you say then uh, the condition of the building is overall what? Uh, extremely poor and not even capable of occupancy if they try to get a new tenant. Okay. But it is leased? Currently leased. I think if the tenants are in place, uh, I'm not exactly sure how that works from the city standpoint, but uh, I've seen better conditioned spaces be denied occupancy until work is done. So you would say this is below average? Oh, yeah. It, they are the worst buildings I've ever seen in Winnipeg. I've probably seen some worse. <laughs> there you go. I think I've seen some worse ones. Yeah. Um, did you bring this to the board last cycle? No, we've. Uh, they called us on... Tuesday before the submissions were due. I've never met these people before. Historically, he's, he's uh, defended these himself. Okay. Thank you. Very nice uh, gentleman, but uh, never, never been dealt with before. Okay. I think that's all my questions. Thank you.
gentlemen, thank you both for appearing today and your time. And this hearing is concluded. Thank you. Thank you.